Lifting gratitude and praises for compassion so amazing. Lord, we've come to give you thanks for all you've done. Because of your love, we're forgiven. Because of your love, our hearts are clean. Songs of freedom forever we're changed because of your love. We're forgiven because of your love. Our hearts are clean. We lift you up with songs of freedom. Because of your love Oh, 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 oh all because of your love Oh, I am free I'm forgiven All because of your love I know exactly what you were thinking. If you saw me approaching the stage, you're like, I didn't know Big could glide so well, okay? I make it look good, all right? But hey, we are so happy that you are spending your Sunday morning here with us. Whether you're here in person, whether you're joining us online, we are thrilled that we get to be a community under one name, and that is Jesus Christ. Today, we're going to talk about all sorts of things. We're going to talk about why we do the things we do. We're going to talk about the mission trip that some of us just came back from. We're going to be able to pray and worship through music together. This is going to be a great morning. Would you all please stand with me and pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you um, for the coolness of the, the gentle rain, or at least gentle where, where we were at. Lord, we thank you for the ability to be here, the ability just to, to be here this morning, to be in community with you, to be in community with each other, to be in community with your people. I thank you for the unity that we can find in you in this room and in all the other rooms that maybe look different, but they're doing the same things this morning. Lord, I just pray that everything we do this morning brings honor and praise to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you all please worship with us through music?
you to take a seat. The hymn we just sang about the Bible, just reminding us that, that they are beautiful words. They change our life uh, and they remodel us along the way. You know, it's good to stay in touch with the Bible. Uh, this uh, passage from Isaiah may be a familiar one to you, and I find, honestly, a lot of comfort in it. And would you join me as we read together? So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Amen. Be not dismayed, whatever be time, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love, That's the truth. For our prayer time today, um, just wanted to take a minute and thank you all. We've been, for the last month or so, been collecting funds to purchase an automobile for our missionary, Babu Samuel, in Kerala, India. And we'd set a goal of between uh, five and seven thousand uh, dollars. We didn't make it, but here's what we did. So. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, uh, I, was, I was really, I was praying for five, O oh, ye of little faith. So you guys showed me, and uh, it's, it's just a wonderful tribute, it's a wonderful uh, gift, and I uh, look forward to hearing from Babu uh, when he's able to make that purchase. It takes a little while to get the money to India for him to get it and get it all arranged, but we will follow up with that uh, once that's taken care of. Uh, it's a huge impact on his ministry. 
So uh, we, we want to be thankful. Uh, thank you. And thank God for putting it on your heart. Uh, you know, every dollar, every nickel that goes out of here comes in because of your hard work and goes out because of your heart uh, for Jesus. And so we, we don't take that for granted. Uh, would you join me as we pray? Father God, uh, you are so gracious to us, and you take care of us. Uh, sometimes we don't understand. Uh, sometimes things happen that we don't like, and uh, we might even blame you for it. And we might even be ungrateful. And so, Lord, for those times, I just pray for forgiveness. Uh, but your bounty is great. Uh, your impact on our hearts is immense. And when we allow you to work through us and in our lives, it truly is a miracle. And you can make everything better, even those tough things that we have to endure, the loss of a loved one or health, that we don't understand why uh, things are falling apart like they are. Uh, Lord, you're just with us all the time. And we thank you for that. You comfort us on our way and remind us that you are God and that you are in charge and uh, we are not. Uh, Lord, it's on you. And uh, we trust you and we lean on you. And uh, we thank you for this immense love that you have for us. Thank you for hearing our prayers in those darkest nights and those happiest of days that you're always there. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll share
I find first I find John chapter 6 to be a fascinating read or study if you will verses 53 and 54 states very truly I tell you unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood you have no life in you whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood as eternal life I will raise them up at the last day and on and on it goes for multiple more verses on the heels of the feeding of the 5,000, the people came to Jesus and they sought out another food miracle. They went as far as to remind him of the manna that God gave to Moses. Jesus, knowing their hearts, knowing that their intentions were superficial, decided to present the gospel. While the words spoken in these passages by Jesus could be viewed as difficult, extreme, and even abrasive, so much so that many of those that followed him left. The fact that one must do this to be saved remains. Jesus refers to himself as the bread that came down from heaven. Verse 29 of John 6 states that the work of God is that you, you believe in the one he has sent. This belief refers to, here is not referring to a head knowledge specifically. This belief surpasses the satisfaction of food, drink, and any other fleshly desire. I believe this is why Jesus injects the picture of consuming his body and drinking his blood, a picture that is by no means superficial. Each Sunday we come to the communion table to do what our Lord instituted in, the, in that upper room with the 12. Matthew 26, 26 and 27 states, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of many. Luke 22, 19 and 20 states, and he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. We also see Paul talk about it in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 16, which states, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks or participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? <clears throat> So as we approach this time of remembrance, let us, not get, let us not forget the words that Jesus spoke. Let us examine ourselves to see if we have spiritually consumed him, making him the Lord of our lives. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for sending your son into this world that we might, that we might have eternal life that one day we might be able to uh, spend our time in your presence, worshiping and glorifying you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. Father, we thank you for uh, the gift that you've given us, and we thank you, Lord, for this time that we can come around this table as a body and remember that gift, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your son, and thank you for your love and kindness. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat>
Okay, I know there were a couple repeat pictures. That's what happens when it's one in the morning and you're like, oh, I need to get that finished, okay? Um, but hey, I just wanted to come to you during this time of offering and thank you. We just got to see um, the amazing things that, that we were able to do as a church to help Babu in India. You guys just saw a representation of, of what happens when we offer up our resources. But more than that, I want to... Um, just say during this time of offering that, that when we talk about offering too often, we focus on finances. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and say that that's not important, especially as a staff member here. Um, but joking aside, offering is so much more. Because as a follower of Jesus Christ, we are called to offer not only our resources, but our time and our effort and our skills and abilities. And that's what that trip was about. I encourage you, if you saw uh, anybody that you know that you saw on there, or even if you don't know them and this is your first time seeing them, if you see them this morning, ask them about the trip. Because it was a representation of, of Wildwood sharing its resources in another area. It's time, it's gifts, it's abilities. I could struggle to tell you guys so many stories of what happened in one week. Those food boxes you saw on there um, was the start of our week. That was not planned. Two of our days we ended up weren't even planned. We got there on Sunday night, late Sunday night, and our leader from the mission organization that we worked with named Praying Pelican, um, she pulled me aside and she goes, hey, so... I have not been able to get in connection with our mission partner for the last three days. We have no idea what we're doing tomorrow. And it's like, okay, well, that's about eight hours from now, so it'll work out. The next morning, she called a friend of hers in Guatemala who said, hey, we have this issue. Do you happen to know anybody in this area? And he goes, hey, I know a guy. So a pastor in Guatemala called back to a pastor in Kentucky and said, hey, do you have anything? We have a team in town and they don't have anywhere to be today. And the team doesn't actually know this part of the story, but, but that pastor says, you have no idea how helpful that would be today. We have 120 food boxes that we need to have prepared for Wednesday. And we're going to prepare them today on Memorial Day. And they're like, great. So we go back up into the mountains and we help build these boxes, these, these boxes that, that feed multiple families. In fact, this little church in, like down this one lane road during the, the height of COVID was the number one food bank in the entire state of Kentucky. They were doing 100,000 pounds of food every month in this little 20, 30 pew church in the mountains of Kentucky. We spent most of our day there building these boxes for people, and they told us afterwards that most of the time, those boxes would have been filled with like three adults and a handful of kids. And so we were able to do it in a fraction of the time that they normally would, and we were able to give them a break. Because of that, we were able to then go back on Wednesday and help distribute those boxes. And we got to see what they do, the line of cars, all the way up into the hills. That was only made possible, one, through prayer, two, through the providence of God, and three, through the offerings of Wildwood Christian Church. And again, I, I tell you that I'm not talking about just finances, although... You guys showed up and showed out when we needed the financial support, so thank you for that. But it's also a reflection of the time that was given by the adults and the students, the talents that were shared, and just the willingness to go when God said, hey, why don't you go to Kentucky for a week? And I will tell you this, selfishly, I think what we brought back is far more significant than what we took. 
Would you all please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so, so very much for this day. We thank you for the people of this community, of the people of this church. We thank you for the people that traveled to um, the most rural parts of Kentucky with us. Lord, I thank you that, that you set in motion things that we couldn't even begin to understand. And Lord, I just pray that, that it in, invigorates and excites the next group that's going to go. More than that, I hope that it invigorates and excites us to give of our time and our talents and our resources, not just a 14-hour drive away, but right here in our own community as well, into all the parts of the earth, because that's what you told us to do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. pretty amazing what God's accomplishing through us, through the church, through Wildwood. Amen? Let's yeah. show a little bit of excitement, maybe, some thrilling... Amen! Thank you. <laughs> no, I just think that it's important for us to recognize with some emotion that God is doing amazing things. But let me ask you this question. Would you rather be busy or blessed? Think about that for a moment. On Friday night... We had a two and a half hour worship evening. Two and a half hours, we had four bands here, people worshiping and singing, people praying and experiencing God. People in the back had, had banners or cloth and they were walking around the room and just all, not dancing, but not performing. They were just worshiping. It was just amazing. All the way through the foyer and out in the parking lot, people are talking and praying with, with one another, singing and so forth. And it was just amazing. Now, it made it a busy week, but we're a busy church. Yesterday, this room and the foyer and the, and the gym was just filled with books. It was a book sale for the homeschoolers. And we shared our building with us. They had a, a, a steer out in the parking lot for some reason. A cow. I don't know why. But see, the truth is that people are using the building and coming together and worshiping God, and we are a busy church. But I go back to my original question, would you rather be busy or blessed? And I'll be very clear that it's a trick question. I think we should be both. But the danger is for us to be busy without being blessed. This is what we don't want. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt busy before? Do you know what I'm talking about? Are, are you with me on this? Your life is so perfect and so, so well-disciplined, you don't, you don't have busy, right? I know that's not true, because when I ask you, hey, how are you? Do you know what I oftentimes hear? Busy. And I'm on a campaign to change that. From now on, when I run into you or you run into me, I'm gonna, I want to be able to say, how are you today? And I want you to be able to say what? I'm blessed. Some people say I'm blessed beyond what I should be. And ain't that the truth? God has given and given to us. Now, when I say busy or blessed, I, I, I'm bringing it up in this way because what I'm really going to talk about today is prayer. Don't turn off. Don't shut down. Oh, prayer. Again, we talk about that so much. Yes, we do talk about prayer a lot. Why? Because prayer is what moves us from busy to also being blessed. Right? The most de basic definition of prayer is talking to God. And what we're talking about today is why do we do what we do at Wildwood? And the question is, why do we pray so much? Just this morning, we prayed at the beginning of the service. We prayed for the communion. We prayed for one another with Robin. We prayed at the offering time. We're going to pray again. You know why we pray so much? Because that's how busy becomes blessed. Now, if you have other questions about why we do what we do here at Wildwood, Make sure and come and ask me or, or ask one of the staff members. This is the last sermon in this series, but we're ending in the right place to talk about prayer. Prayer is talking to God. Prayer is communication of the human soul which God created and the creator of the soul itself. Prayer, I believe, is the primary way for the believer, for the disciple, for you and I to communicate with Christ with not only words, but with emotions and desires and fellowship. Prayer can be audible, like we oftentimes share here. 
It can be silent. It can be public or private. It can be very formal. Write it out. It can be, be, be very personal or informal. But in prayer, just three quick things that I want you to hold on to. If we go all the way back to the beginning, if I can only teach three things about prayer, these would be the three things I would teach. Number one, prayer must be prayed in faith. James chapter 1, verse 6 says, Ask in faith without doubting. Now, some people have misunderstood this. Some people think that if you're going to pray for something, then you should believe you're going to get it, even to the point where they will pray in that way. God, I know that you want me to get that raise at work. And so I'm praying, believing that tomorrow that boss is going to offer me twice as much as I make right now. I'm believing in faith that you are going to give this to me, and I'm going to claim that promise. Now, confidence in prayer is a good thing. But I know that sometimes my kids have come to me, when they, especially when they were smaller, and were just convinced that I was going to give them what they wanted. Dad, I want this candy bar, and you're going to give it to me. And I thought, yes, I am going to give it to you, kid. <laughs> we're not manipulating God. We're not trying to convince him. We're not trying to cajole him or somehow push him into something. No, when James says that we have to ask in faith and without doubting, that means we have to believe that God exists. Does it make any sense to pray to a God that doesn't exist? No. It's like talking to somebody who's not there. And yet, I have known people who have been atheists, those who would say, I don't believe in God. I don't believe there is this good spirit in the sky. I don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. I don't believe the Holy Spirit is, even exists. And yet, these are some of the same people, when the world falls apart, what will they oftentimes ask for? Prayer. I know sometimes some people couch it, would you give me good wishes or hold good thoughts for me? Well, number one, you have to believe that God exists. So let's just start off on the very basic. Do we believe that God exists? Yes. yes. Do you believe that God is in this room with us? Yes. In your car on the way here, in your home when you woke up this morning, at the table when you sit down to eat, in your job where you go? Yes, God is all those places, and so he definitely exists. Now, let me, let me throw this out, out there. Let's say that my wife and I get in a car and go on vacation. Oh, by the way, I'm doing that in a couple of weeks. We're going to take a long car ride. And, I, and so is she going to be with me on this vacation? Yes, I believe that she's going to be with me. But we're going to get in the car, and I'm never going to speak to her. I'm, just, I'm going to acknowledge that she's there. Yep, she's in the car. She's got her seatbelt on. And then I'm not going to speak to her. I'm not going to share anything with her. How good of a vacation will this be? And yet, you just told me that God is with you wherever you go. How much time does he spend sitting in that passenger seat waiting to be acknowledged, spoken to, consulted, or in some way involved in your life? How much time in your life have you simply ignored the fact that God was with you? It's a little convicting, isn't it? Because God is always with me. When I'm washing the dishes, he's there. Mowing the lawn, he's there. Making a decision, having a conversation, watching baseball on TV, he's always there. And he wants to bless me. So that's step number one. Step number two is prayer must not only be prayed in faith, but prayer must also be in the name of Jesus. John 16, 23, Jesus said, put it very clearly, whatever you ask for in my name. Now, why would I want to ask for something in Jesus' name? Because he is the mediator between me and God. He's the go-between. He is the telephone line. He's the Bluetooth connection. He is what gets me to God. I was separated from God because of my sin. Because of my sin, I said to God, I don't want you anymore. I don't want to be connected to you. I don't want to have, any, any, uh, have your, your influence over me in any way. So Jesus came along and said, I will reconnect this broken relationship. I have to realize that I only have this connection with God because of Jesus. And this is how I'm connected to him. So the second thing we must know is that I have to believe that God exists and that the only way that I have that connection is through Christ himself. Thirdly, we must pray not only in faith, not only in the name of Jesus, but also in the power of the Holy Spirit. There is a verse in Romans that really <laughs> amazes me, Romans 8, where it says that we don't know what to pray for. 
As a matter of fact, sometimes our words sound like to God a babbling, a language that he doesn't speak, like a baby who's just crying out. And that the Holy Spirit interprets even the groanings of our hearts. So sometimes you say, I don't know what to pray. Do this, just babble, just cry, just put, put, put something together. Don't be concerned about how eloquent don't be concerned about the words and how many syllables are in each word or whether it sounds like somebody else or whatever. Just go to God and share your heart, share your mind, share your spirit with him and recognize that the Holy Spirit is the power behind that prayer. Right? The other day, I was on my cell phone. I was talking to somebody and I was talking away a blue streak. I was really laying it down. It, what I was saying was really important. And somewhere in the middle, I realized that my phone had turned off. <laughs> do you ever do that? So you're talking away and maybe the other person says, wait a minute, you cut out there, I missed all of that. I'm like, that was good stuff. Praying in the Holy Spirit is sort of like that. We have to understand that the Spirit empowers us. No spirit no connection. Now, of course, the Son, who we're praying in his name, Jesus, and the Spirit are all part of the triune God, right? It's all to God together. But in different ways, they're connecting with us, which means God wants to hear not only from us, but he wants to speak to us. Let me say that again. God not only wants to hear from us, but God also wants to speak to us. Prayer is a two-way street. Now, the truth is, Psalm 10, 4 tells me that the wicked have absolutely no desire to pray. I mentioned before that some people say, I don't believe in God, and I don't believe in prayer, and so I'm not going to speak to him. And yet, when the going gets tough, they still want those prayers. But ultimately, if you are a person that says, I'm not much of a prayer, I don't care about prayer, I don't care about connectedness, Psalm says that you are wicked, evil. Why? Because again, you're making yourself out to be your own god or your own goddess. Taking counsel only from yourself or from somebody or something else. Right? You may be very busy, but guess what you will not be? Blessed. And I have I suspicion that every single one of us in here wants to be blessed. Sometimes I talk to couples who are living together but have never been married. And I say, what's the difference? I said, the difference is very obvious. You have never gone to your heavenly Father and asked to be blessed. You're playing house. You're trying to get along. You're in this relationship. I, I, I get that. But you will never be as happy. You will never be as successful. You will never be what God wants you to be because you are not blessed. Now, you may be sitting there right now and saying, well, that's not me. I got married 47 years ago. And this woman better be privileged to know she's married to me. And that very well may be true, and God may have blessed your marriage in many different ways. But I'm saying day by day, of all of your busyness that you do, you may be struggling more than you need to because you are busy, but you are not blessed. Because everything you do can be, a, can be blessed by God. Everything you do can have a greater, higher purpose. Everything you do can be more than just the effort that you put into it. Your job, your relationships, your thinking, everything can be blessed. Are you still with me? We haven't even begun to get to the sermon yet, so hang on. We're pretty busy today. We've got a lot of things to talk about. Was that lightning? Or was that the spirit? We good, Gary? Keep rolling? Okay. If I get electrocuted, pray for me, brothers. As... Creatures created by God. I already mentioned that we are evil if we don't want to pray. We also have to recognize that it's a natural desire to want to learn to pray. So of all the things, I, I've just put down a whole bunch of things I want to talk about prayer today, and one of those things is don't be afraid to, to admit that we have to learn how to pray. Are you with me? When a small child just begins to, to talk, what they do is they imitate the cadence or the sounds that they hear, but it's not really words. Have you ever been around a little baby or a little child and they start babble talking? It's like, I have no idea what you're saying, but it sounds good. I almost, sound, I almost hear syllables and sentences and once in a while even a question. And 
And sometimes, remember I said, our prayer sounds like that to God. God says, I don't know what you're saying. The Holy Spirit has to interpret the way that a mother would interpret for her child. But do you, my question is, do you have a desire to learn better? Do you have a desire to know what prayer is and how to pray? Not just how to use the right words. We're not trying to convince God of anything, but we want to pray in a way that brings us blessing and connection with him. We have to understand that even the disciples went to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. I don't have time, which I did, to go through the whole Lord's Prayer and what he taught them. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. You could study that for a year and learn how to pray and still not have plumbed the depths of all of that. Now Paul talks about this when he says, Do not be anxious about, everything, about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God... By the way, that's a blessing. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let me summarize. He says, when, if, when you are getting anxious about things, like Trump getting indicted, or President Biden falling down, or Liv taking over PGA golf, or maybe the baseball game that's coming up, but you're worried about anything, what are you supposed to do? In every situation, by prayer right? With thanksgiving, present your request to God. We don't pray often enough. Anybody agree with that? We don't pray often enough. And we don't learn how to pray often enough. God wants us to talk about everything with him. We should often be in prayer. We are told that we are to pray without ceasing, constantly aware that God is with us. We should keep a running conversation, going with God all the day long. Luke chapter 18, verse 1 says this, pray and do not lose heart. Okay, we don't take that nearly seriously enough. When we are not feeling blessed, then we are feeling down, disappointed, discouraged, and depressed. We are losing heart. If you have to do something in your life that you just don't have a heart for, you say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to face that. I don't want to go through that. What should you do? Pray. Lord, you brought this into my world for a reason. You brought this person into my world for a purpose. You in some way want to bless this, and I want to see what you have for me. And I'm here for and with you. Now, having said all these things, I'm going to go in a little bit of a different direction, okay? We're going to have some slides and some, some, and some scriptures here. But sometimes I think we're not intentional enough with our prayers. We don't really know what we're praying for because we're not very organized. We're not very disciplined. We're not very, very, very uh, focused on what we're really doing. We're not intentional. So there are two things I want to talk about this morning. One is posture, and the other is purpose. The first one is posture, the second one is purpose. The, the where what we do with our bodies in prayer sometimes will give us a key to our intention in prayer. Now, don't read too much into this. This is simply my observation. Reading through Scripture, looking for things about prayer, suddenly realizing that people put their bodies into different positions, oftentimes based upon what they were praying about. Now, this isn't some secret formula. If you get into this certain body shape, God will hear or bless you more. That's not what I'm saying, okay? Don't go out of here mad. And if you do, throw rocks at somebody else. All I'm saying is that it's an interesting study to see sometimes how our body can communicate things. We would call it body language, right? If somebody comes into your office like this, what do you know? You are in for it, right? Or if they come up to you and say, hey, I'm good to see you. I like to see that, as opposed to somebody who says, come here. Body posture, that's what I'm talking about. And prayer is very similar for the little kids. And I'm going to be around a bunch of little kids this coming week. We teach them how to pray very simply. We say, now it's time to fold our hands. Do you know why we say that? So they don't touch anybody else. We say, it's time to close our eyes. Do you know why? Because when there's a bunch of kids, I need every advantage I can get, and I want to I have eyes that they have theirs closed. 
Fold your hands, close your eyes, close your lips. Why do we say that? So that, so that, that they don't bite each other. Because kids will do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then also, fold your hands, close your eyes, close your lips, and then focus on God. We're giving them a prayer posture. So I want to give you a few prayer postures today. Okay, again, there's no right or wrong. There just is. But here's some postures I found in Scripture. Number one, standing. Did you notice at the beginning of our service, Chris said, would you stand with me while we pray? Why do we do that at the beginning of the service? Why do we do this? Because standing is oftentimes a sign of respect. We are recognizing that God is in this place. We stand in his presence and we begin to pray. That's exactly what we're talking about. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, robbers and evildoers and adulterers, even this tax collector, he says. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I had. But the tax collector, he stood in prayer at a distance. He wouldn't even look up into heaven. He beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Both of these men are standing, but only one is being respectful. Which one? The Pharisee or the tax collector? The tax collector. He stood at a distance out of respect for being in the presence of God. The Pharisee knew that the presence of God was there, and he stood, but not out of respect to God, but out of his own selfish ego. So just because I'm in a certain position doesn't mean that I definitely have that attitude, but I want to have that attitude of gratitude. I want to have that attitude of respect, and so I stand before God. I've been to court a couple of times in my life, not as a defendant, but for other reasons. But when the judge walks in the room, what do they say? All stand or rise because you want to show respect to the judge and then he gets to tell you when to sit. And we do the same thing here at church. We want to show that respect. Sometimes we have you stand when we read scripture, especially the gospels, out of respect. So it's your body posture that changes as, as in terms of your prayers. Posture number two I found in scripture is sitting. Seated just the way that you are right now, being in a seated posture when you are praying typically demonstrates one who is seeking guidance or counsel, right? Or an instruction from the God, from God. We said earlier that prayer is a dialogue. It's not a monologue. It's just not me just talking to God, but rather it's a conversation. And sometimes we have to be quiet and listen. Sometimes people will come to me and say, hey, you know, I, I have something to talk to you about or I have a question to ask. And it would be very natural to say, hey, let's sit down and talk. Right? Again, it's a posture of we're on equal footing. We're here to discuss something. We're going we're to spend some time doing this. We're not going to stand the whole time. I'm not going to make you have, have respect like that. Even Dorothy and the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and the Lion, when they got before Oz, what happened? They stood before him. But when they realized that they were equals... They sat down together. King David sat down before the Lord. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, it says, Then King David went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? What a great question, isn't it? God, who do you think I am, and why are you blessing me like this? He wanted an answer to his question. He wanted to have a conversation, so they sat down together. I don't know what you do, how you pray, but there are times when you should stand in respect and sit in counsel. Third one, we don't do this as often, or maybe you do, I don't, but kneeling before God. I always picture a child on their knees at bedtime, their hands upon the bed, right? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. But if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I memorized that a long time ago. But it's a kneeling prayer, which is a, which is a prayer of repentance, humility, submission, asking for God to bless you, bringing your request to God. In Ezra, in the Old Testament, chapter 9, it says, At the evening sacrifice, I rose from my heaviness my depression, my sadness. He said, I got motivated to stand up and then I fell upon my knees and spread my hands out before the Lord God Almighty. 
Okay? The content of the prayer can be there no matter what your body posture. But Ezra says that he just kind of fell, kind of slumped down before the Lord. Psalm 95 says, Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord God our Maker. I knew somebody like that. They would be talking to somebody, sitting in counseling, and then all of a sudden they would say, get, get down on the floor here with me. Just pray right now here with me. Get on your knees. It's a sign of submission. Sometimes we put our body into a posture that, 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 that leads us into prayer. Daniel chapter 6. He got down on his knees three times a day. You know what that tells me? He's in better shape than I am. Right? And there are churches that have kneelers and altars and so forth, and that's not our tradition, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a powerful picture of kneeling before God. Acts chapter 9, Peter sent them out of the room. He got down on his knees and prayed. Turning towards the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. And she opened her eyes, seeing Peter kneeling there. Peter was kneeling in supplication and prayer for somebody else. I'm on my knees praying for you. It's a sign of submission. It's interesting to me that Philippians chapter 2 that tells us that when Christ returns, right, no matter what your, you know, what your theology, what your idea is about prayer posture, when Christ returns, he says, when Christ returns, every knee will bow. You will go down before him, either on purpose, because you're worshiping the Christ, or because he makes you out of respect. You will pray before him. Thirdly is prone. Prone means to lie prostrate, to pray lying on your belly, face in the dirt. It's for a prayer of desperate plea. I just throw myself out before you, Lord. I've seen people pray like this. I've prayed like this before. We've had people who have come in here and just laid on the floor before the Lord. Right? Why do we do this? Because it's this urgent request. It's an expression to God, a complete and utter dependence upon him. I give myself over to you. Joshua chapter 7. Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the Ark of the Covenant before the evening. And the elders joined him and they put their face in the dust. This is a play of desperation. This is a crying out to God. Jesus himself is recorded in Matthew 26. Jesus said to his disciples, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch, all right? Keep praying. And then he went a little beyond them, and Jesus fell on his face. He's praying just all out to God and said, My Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but ultimately it's up to your will. See, it's a prayer posture. I'm putting my body into a place that, that, that links up with the intention of my prayer. Revelation 7, And the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four beasts, and they all fell before the throne in prayer. Last one, lying down. If prone is face down, lying down is face up. And you probably have prayed like this, maybe even just last night, because this is a prayer of meditation. Not meditating like in yoga, but meditating meaning I'm thinking about something. Psalm 4.4, when you're on your bed, search your hearts and be silent. In other words, I'm just laying back and saying, okay, I'm going to think about these things in the presence of God. And the reason I say you probably did it last night, because maybe you pray when you went to bed. And people ask me all the time, is it okay to fall asleep in the middle of a prayer? And I say, oh, Yes. Your heavenly Father is there with you, holding you, cradling you, and you are like a little baby just falling asleep in his arms. So you're laying there just thinking about his greatness or about his power or about his grace or about his gifts, about the blessings that he's given you. You're thinking about the scripture that you read just a moment ago or focusing on something you've read before. Psalm 63 says, When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you the night for the whole night watch, meaning all night long, for you have been my help. Now, having said that, these are the postures of prayer. And there can be as many as you want. Maybe you have your own special one. Maybe you just give God a thumbs up or a smile at the clouds or whatever you do. But that posture is your intentional prayer. Sometimes we're not nearly intentional enough with our prayers. We just throw things out and we're talking like babies. And I'm challenging you to be a bit more organized. But also there's purpose for our prayers. And I have just a couple of minutes to throw these out there. But the, but the prophet Elijah 
was being blamed by the people for what was going on in the country, much like we're experiencing today. If you Christians would just keep your mouth shut about what you think of as truth, then we could just do what we wanted, and we wouldn't have to worry about you. But Elijah said the same thing that we say. It is my plea to pray that our nation, that our country, that our society would change to, to the greater good. Right? And so at, at one point, there's a sacrifice. I'm just going to read this paragraph to you, and then we're going to tear it apart. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are the God of Israel and that I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning back their hearts again. I don't know what your purpose in prayer is beyond just connecting to God and being blessed. But Elijah gives us three other purposes that I want you to hold on to. Number one is this. We pray so that God may be glorified. Notice what he says there. Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that, what? You are God. Who's in charge of this world? God is. Who's in charge of this government? God is. Who's in charge of the war in Ukraine? Ultimately, God is. Right? People are trying to insert themselves and do what they're doing. You you do this in your life all the time, but I want you to to know that when you pray, you want to put God back on the throne for whatever you're praying about. Lord, I was looking at my finances. I have too many bills and not enough money. And he says, that's okay. I'll be in charge of that. I have too much to do at work today and not enough time to get it all done. You know what he says? I'll take care of that. He says, you you say, my family is falling apart. My kids are going crazy. You know what he says? Okay, I'll get involved in that too. Right? We put God back on the throne and we get to what was called Sabbath. Sabbath isn't just taking a rest. God is putting, Sabbath is putting God in charge of all those things. And we get to say, I trust in you to lead me. When I try to do it by myself, I'm getting too busy and not enough what? Blast. Did you, did you forget about that already? When I'm getting, I, I don't want to be too busy, I want to be blessed. The second thing that he tells us is that we pray not only so that God may be glorified, but also that we can affirm our relationship with him. Okay? We're getting in connected with him again. Notice what it says. I am your servant and I've done all these things at your command. I want to make sure that what I'm doing in sending this email and going to visit that person in doing this task, in pulling back, in switching jobs, or whatever I'm doing, I want to know I'm doing it because you have commanded me to. Too many Christians do what they want to do and then pray that it's blessed. I've even heard people preach that. Do your best and pray that it's blessed. You know what the problem with that is? Your best stinks. It's not going to work if it's not God's best. Right? Right? So we all want to say, God, I am in relationship with you. I've given you charge of all these things, and then I will move when and how you instruct me to, and not before. But I want to reconfirm that relationship with you so that thirdly and lastly, it will turn other people's attention back to God. I am praying so that they see the power of God in my life, and they will want that too. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God. And will turn their hearts back to you. Posture and purpose are incredibly valuable in our prayer life. We stand out of respect, we sit for counsel, we kneel in repentance, we lie prone in desperation, we lie on our beds and we meditate on God so that he may be glorified, that we may have the relationship that others may be blessed through our prayers. I don't know. When you gather together for lunch today and you say that little table, Grace, you know, bless this food, there's so much more going on there than just saying something quick before you eat. Let your prayer life grow. We are a busy church we're looking to be blessed. Let me pray for you right now. Father God, we come before you thanking you for all of these words, too many words perhaps, too many stories, but Lord, I pray that you have been working in our hearts and minds. I pray that you have been here listening, but more than that, that you've been speaking through me, that each heart and each mind would have heard exactly what you needed them to hear. 
We are busy, but Lord, now we want to be blessed in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our response to God. service this morning. I just want you guys to make sure that if you didn't grab one on your way in, make sure that you grab the connection so you know all the things that are going on around Wildwood. A couple of things we want to highlight is fast approaching is the next Wildwood Academy seminar. This one is called Emotional Balance. It's June 23rd. We're going to have, and I want to make sure to get it right, Dr. Ron Weimer. Weimer. Um, no. Dr. Pastor Friend Ron Weimer um, is in a panel of local counselors and professionals will be present here to talk about leadership anxiety and the church leader. It will be a, a great evening. I encourage you, if you have the time, the ability, come in and learn and glean from that panel of professionals, including Pastor Doctor. I don't know if it's Dr. Pastor or Pastor Doctor, but all the pastor, doctors, Weimers. Um, but uh, join us for that. Also, fast approaching, even faster approaching, um, is camp. So Camp Neboa Discovery Week is next week. If you have any questions about that or you've um, volunteered for that, again, talk to Dr. Pastor Weimer or uh, Christy, our children's director, because they're the ones that are running that week at camp. And we look forward to telling you all about it um, afterwards. Not me, because I won't be there. There are kids there, okay? I do teens, all right? Um, but no, we are so excited about this amazing summer that's going on. So please, please, again, check out the connection and join with us as a community of Christ as we do life together. All right, would you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so, so very much for this day. We thank you once again for the opportunity to be in here each and every week and to praise your name and to learn about you and to hear your word preached and, and all the things that, that seem so automatic sometimes, but it really is amazing that we get this opportunity. Lord, I just pray that as we leave this place that, that you would help us to see that, that we are not entering into the community, we are entering into the mission field. Or that we would live in a way that honors you, not just on Sunday mornings, but every moment of every day. That we would recognize when we have a misstep, that we'd be quick to apologize, that we would be quick to lend a hand, that we'd be quick to offer up ourselves. Lord, I pray that you help us not to just be your people in title only, but to actually live as though we truly believed it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Wildwood, well, go in peace.
probably. Um, when I took it out, I just kind of. Would you like me to? Sure.